Good evening, everybody, and welcome to another edition of UFO Man Live. This week, we've actually done a double header, so tonight is our second live stream in a row, so welcome. Uh, tonight, we're going to be talking about several things. Last night at the end of our live stream, we talked about the Crater Report, but before we do that, I'm going to introduce myself. My name is Tim, or UFO Man, and to my side is my friend and my co-host, Tommy Highway. Tommy, introduce yourself. Hey folks, I'm Tommy Highway. I want to thank everybody for coming out as always. Tonight we're doing our regularly scheduled broadcast, so we really appreciate everybody for coming out. Got a great show for you. We've got some old stuff, we've got some new stuff, and of course, we've as always, we've got our wonderful uh, video, UFO video of the Reek Review. So thanks for hanging in there with us, folks. Yeah, okay. This evening we're going to talk about the Crater Report first, be, get that out of the way. Back in 2019, Luis Elizondo, Christopher Mellon, and another gentleman broke free of the TTSA partnership, and they formed their own group called ADAM, and this is their logo, ADAM Research Project. ADAM Research Project was established to study metamaterials or UFO craft debris, such as this one that is famously portrayed in this image. Um, they formed a partnership then again with the TTSA because the TTSA and Adam got a $1 million contract from the Department of Defense to study metamaterials. And they had to come out with a CRADA report. A CRADA report is what, Tommy? Can you read that? You're muted. Sorry about that. It, CRADA is a cooperative research and development agreement. Uh, and is it, it is any format written agreement between one or more federal laboratories and one or more non-federal parties under which the government, through its laboratories, provides personnel, services, facilities, equipment, intellectual property, or other resources. No funds may be provided by the federal laboratories to the non-federal parties. The non-federal parties may provide funds, personnel, services, facilities, equipment, intellectual property, or other resources toward the conduct of any specified research or development efforts that are consistent with the missions of the Bureau. Any property and equipment provided under technology transfer mechanisms will be provided in accordance with established property management policies and procedures. Okay, Crater Reports are to come out between 2020 and 2023. They're supposed to be issued to Congress every fiscal year from 2020 to 2023. Now the 2020 report never materialized to the public and it was supposed to be released in a public format as well and that was not done. Uh, if it was done, it hasn't been talked about by the media or by the UFO community. Um, there is another report coming out in September of 2021 until 2023. Now, Adam and To The Stars Academy, remember, received a million dollars from the Department of Defense to study this material. Um, million dollars really isn't much, but uh, the uh, research is ongoing, and we thought we'd let you know here first on the UFO Man channel. Okay. Tommy, you want to introduce the next segment? Well, actually, let's talk about the metamaterials for a moment. Okay. You know, uh, we know that these materials exist. I mean, we've, we've been, this has been verified by Mellon, by um, Luis Elizondo, and other people along the way. What's that eccentric millionaire with the space program guy? What's his name? Uh, uh, owns Bigelow? Skin, yeah, owns a skinwalker, Bigelow. He's confirmed this. I mean, they're, they're actually not, those, those are just to name a few, basically. Yeah, Hal Putoff is yeah, another one. Exactly. Uh, Jacques Vallée, he's another one. A lot of people have been talking about UFO crash debris and the possession of the U.S. government. That's right. And, and this has been going on for, this is not a new thing. It's been going on for years. So I guess the biggest question is, okay, well, where did it come from? Where did we find this material to be able to, to run tests on? Where did it actually originate from? And that's one of the things that I'd certainly hope that we would have seen in the report, which we, of course, got a great big box of trick cereal with that one. Um, but that being said, you know, this stuff had to come from somewhere. 
Now the rumors are that it's 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 laid down in like the layers of like a micronic layers in the manufacturing process is that we to this day on this planet cannot duplicate. That's how interesting this material is. But it's just another one of those things that I fear that we'll never we'll never hear about. We'll never know the truth on because again the government, like we've been complaining about since the uh, the release of the report, continue to keep this stuff from us. This information is still classified for for really no good reason in our opinion. Yeah. Actually, I got to say this, Luis Elizondo is so disgusted with the fact that the information isn't being put out there to the public that he's even threatening to run for Congress to change those laws. Now, once he gets there, is he going to change his stance and no longer want to release that information? I don't know. I, I would have to say possibly because in the beginning when Luis Elizondo came out, he was always hem hawing around the issue because of the, his non disclosure agreement. So, if he were to go back into the service of the federal government, don't you think he'd be hindered by that, Tommy? Oh, absolutely. In fact, his, the days of, of Luis Elizondo, Mellon, or any of those guys being government employees and, and obtaining security clearances or anything like that are, are long gone. I mean, they might as well forget it. And but that's, I mean, they knew that going into it. I mean, they absolutely knew. And and I'm sure that those guys, well, Mellon is like a from a, a multi-billionaire family, if I'm not mistaken. He doesn't need money. Luis Elizondo, I um, mean, the guy could, could make money on the circuit, but the speaking circuit for the rest of his life. So it's not like it's a big deal to these folks in terms of financial gain. But it is, it is a sad shame that they had to go to the links that they had to go through to release the information that we've actually been able to see at this point. Um, and I think Christopher Mellon goes into that and really, really, um, really nails it every time he, he, he talks about it. He's like, look, you know, we had to go a, around the government to be able to provide this information to Congress. And think about that. Congress is the government. So, <laughs> you know, that that's that's the kind of roadblocks that unfortunately that everybody in ufology has been um, has been coming up against for the last. Well, ever since 47 anyway. Oh, maybe even longer. But yeah. what I'm going to say is, is that Christopher Mellon has contact in the CIA. That's a relative. So that really helps out for him. But in regards to uh, Luis Elizondo, he's just connected through the fact that he was a private contractor for the U.S. government in regards to uh, uh, counterintelligence and things of that nature for a while. So Sometimes I personally wonder whether some of the things he's coming out with isn't really counterintelligence and not necessarily uh, what we want to hear in the ufology community and uh, have released to the public. You know, I've always doubted that his sincerity is necessarily the truth. Well, um, that that could very well be, and it's not like we we haven't. Uh seen the government just unload uh, just massive amounts of misinformation regarding the subject of ufology, UFOs, the whole thing. That You can go all the way back to the Bob Lazar thing for that. Um, you know, and some would even say that the Bob Lazar had that little bit of legal trouble in, uh, in Las Vegas. It's something that nobody else would have got busted for, okay? They, they busted him for something that anybody else would have been like, nope, you know, there, there would have been a case. But yet they got he was he built some piece of software for a brothel. Um, turned out the brothel was illegal or something like that. And because he he I guess designed this software accounting software, if I'm not mistaken, um, you know he got pinched, arrested, uh, all the, the whole nine yards. And it was like a slap on the on the wrist because even if found guilty, the crime itself um, there was no stiff penalty for. But I often believe that that was because of his involvement in ufology and, and his story that he told. I also think that when they raided his laboratory recently, his nuclear laboratory, that uh, that was another slap on the wrist to kind of get him to stop talking because he came out again and started really releasing information and stating, hey, I was inside of an alien spacecraft. It was not from Earth. You know, coming definitively out and saying that, it's like saying, hey, we've got UFOs here that are definitely alien nature. If you look at the actual government reports on that raid, and I have seen this information, um, they continue to talk about the reason for the raid uh, being the suspicion that his company was actually selling radioactive material that was, which you can do. 
I mean, for like scientific experiments or whatever, you can do that as long as it's not, there's like a certain limit, okay, that it, ha it can only be so radioactive, let's say. It can only be throwing so many rads or whatever. And apparently that that's the guys that they use to go in there and make sure that he was actually selling nuclear material that was below that threshold. Now, look, this is Bob Lazar we're talking about. Obviously a smart guy. I mean, if you're selling radioactive material online, you know what you're selling. I mean, I absolutely believe that he knew that. Yeah. So, and, and he would have known if this stuff wouldn't have, uh, if this particular material would have been above the, you know, the threshold for sale or whatever. It's legal for sale, I should say. Um, I don't, I don't know. I, I think that it was part harassment. I also think that he implied, and, and he did imply this a few times before, right before, in fact, he got raided that he might even have in his possession uh, some quantity of element 115. Right. That's why they raided him. Yeah. And, and I believe that's the reason. That's the root cause right there. And they, right. they sent everybody. I mean, they sent everybody and the kitchen sink. I mean, there was the ATF, the NSA, the local police, the state police, the county police, you name it. They sent the entire boat there uh, to, to go through his laboratory. Now, Bob Lazar was not arrested. He was not detained. Uh, right. He's not been convicted of anything based on that raid. And if they're going to send the entire look, if they think you're doing something funky, like you're selling uh, radioactive material that's a little bit too hot, they're going to send a couple of agents to your house or to your business. That's what they're going to do. That's how they're going to handle that. They're not going to send 250 people into your business over something like that. Now, if you were dealing weapons grade plutonium or something like that, well, then sure, that would be a different story. But that wasn't the case here. And they knew it. They just used it as a guise. Right. Uh, he supposedly had like a few ounces of 115, which is the element used to uh, for the propulsion systems of some of these alien craft. Mm -hmm. So uh, if he had it, then he was finding out some information about zero point gravity and other things like that, any anti gravity propulsion. And they didn't want him to have access to that information and may make it public based on the fact that he had gone public in the past. Absolutely. So, so you, yeah. You better believe that that Bob Lazar, when he first came out, that was probably one of the most, I would say, uncomfortable scenarios that the government could have possibly been in. I mean, they, here they've got this guy that that worked for them and did all this secret stuff, and he's out there blabbing about it. Um, you know, and they, and, they, and they did try to kill him. They, tr they tried to take a shot at him. There was um, the incident where he and a buddy of his, well, first of all, Bob Lazar's a Corvette guy. You always see Bob Lazar in a Corvette. Okay. Over the years, he probably still got a Corvette, but he and a friend of his went to the gym one day and, and Bob Lazar was paranoid and used to carry around, I believe it was an Uzi submachine gun, a small little machine gun, but not that small. And uh, cause you used to be able to do that back in the eighties. <laughs> anyway, um, they came out of the gym after working out, both the doors were open on his vehicle and that the weapon itself was laying out on the seat. Now, obviously, if someone was going to break in, you know, to, for, to, to uh, steal something out of his vehicle, that machine gun would be gone, and it's laying right there, okay? Sometime after that, there was a shot taken at him, uh, and his Corvette had a bullet hole in it, you know? And he's got, he had photographic evidence of that. So, if yeah, a guy... So, somebody tried to run him off the road, too. That, yeah, times. yeah. So, if a guy is a crackpot, if a guy... Is just out there telling a big story for for his own publicity or whatever. You know, normally those kinds of things, like the government taking a shot at him, don't occur. I don't occur. Um, but in this case, I believe it did. So. Yeah. So uh, we find Bob Lazar to be very credible. So in regards to this meta material and um, element one fifteen, they're both subjects that are still being researched. So if you want information on these subjects, just check out, check out Element 115 on Google and also check out Bob Lazar and also check out the CRADA report. Um, very, very interesting. It's very in-depth. Um, why the original CRADA report 2020 wasn't released to the public as specified by the agreement between to the SARS Academy and Adam is unknown at this point. Yeah. Well, I think it's just another example of the government making a deal with absolutely no intention whatsoever of abiding by the terms of that agreement. 
We've seen right. that. I mean, we just saw that. Everybody that just got a every well, at least every American citizen. I'll put it that way. That just got a load of that that turkey of a report that they just uh, they just gave us. I don't know. If you don't feel like you've been slapped in the face, you probably should be slapped in the face. <laughs> right, right. That was a uh, Lucky Charms type mm -hmm. report. We got all the sweet stuff, but no information. Absolutely. Yep. Exactly. Okay, well, what we're going to do next is we're going to start out with our UFO Man video review of the week. Uh, we got some really good ones. Uh, hope you enjoy them. Here we go. Dude, see, look, that's some UFOs. I'm telling you, like, what is that? Look at that shit. I'm sorry for the bad language, but that shit's crazy. <laughs> we forgive you. My tree's getting away now. Look. Look at that. No, dude. No, dude. See, look, that's some UFOs. I'm telling you, like, what is that? Look at that shit. I'm sorry for the bad language, but that shit's crazy. <laughs> Hard to tell. It's a line of lights. Um, right, exactly. You know, I mean, could be kind of anything, I guess. That's one of the lights. But with the pixelization of the camera, it's hard to tell. Well, it's not moving. It's just kind of hanging there. Yep. In, it looks like it's a solid object to me because there's no variation in it. I mean, it's like drones are bobbing, or bobbling around up that high up, especially. It's way up there. Right. Wait till I get zoomed in. I'll zoom in here and then uh, we can take a real good look at it. Here we go. It reminds me of the uh, tubular shaped UFO that dropped into the ocean outside of Hawaii about a year ago. Kind of. But I have to be honest, it also reminds me of a strand of LED lights. So I don't know what it is. I, I just don't. That's just not drones. I don't. I, that, that's something that's. They're all lined up way too pretty for that. Yes, I have a still shot too. I have three of them.
Yeah, it's it's like one object of some kind. It's way up there. When you see him zoom, he's zooming really far up in the sky. Yes. So. Okay, we're on to a Mexican UFO. Now I got to play the sound on this one. What appears to be a disc or diamond shaped vehicle, ET or man made, unknown at this time, traveling toward the northwest against a 20 mile an hour steady breeze. So it's exhibiting propulsion on its own. What it is, whether it's a UFO or a drone, is unknown. But this appears very much like other diamond-shaped vehicles that I have posted on the UFO Man channel in the past. It looks a lot like them. So make an assessment. Let me know what you think it is down in the comments. And as always, thank you for watching. Coming up will be an enlarged version of this raw footage where I've enlarged it times two. Also, there will be some still images at the end of the clip. So stay tuned for the images so you can get a real good close look. And as always, thank you. Anyways, um, yeah, it looks like a walnut kind of. And there's that one movie that came out by Disney uh, where it showed a silver craft with a kid piloting it. I can't remember what it was called. If any of you in the uh, chat room remembers the name of the movie, I don't, I don't remember what it was called. But the craft flying there looks just like it, the same type of shape. Hi, Nancy. Nice to see you. Yeah, we've seen the walnut design before. <clears throat> yeah, it's pretty common. Oh, the movie is Flight of the Navigator. Thank, Lucathetics. Oh, speaking of that, um, we do have a, do we not have a drawing tonight or? No, not tonight. Right. We're going to be having a drawing uh, coming up in the future here for some free promo codes to some free books by Terry Lovelace. This one here are three lights over Stockton, California. Now, it could be a TR-3B, or it could be something other. I don't know. That is definitely one object. Look at the way that those lights are moving. They are perfectly in unison the whole time. I mean, you're looking at, they're, they're attached to straight edges, I promise. Yeah, and it moves as one object. See mm -hmm. that? Yeah. So I think it's a TR-3B, Alien Reverse Engineered Vehicle or Alien Reproduction Vehicle. Uh, the only thing you don't see is the red light in the middle. See, Belgium, oh. for, for whatever reason, there was a Belgian wave of craft just like this uh, many years ago. A bunch of them. I mean, they were reporting them all the time, scrambling fighters after them, the whole deal. They looked just like that. And they felt that some of those over Belgium were not uh mm -hmm. alien reproduction vehicles they thought they were alien in nature let's see if i can get the sound on this one What's interesting about this one is they're Kelly green in color. I, um, I've i seen one uh, Kelly green ball of light shoot across uh, my windshield uh, from the ground up and across the, uh, the sky, but I've never seen four in a row. Well, a lot of times a meteor will also burn Kelly green because of the nickel content of it. But that's obviously not falling from the sky. That one right there is stationary, whatever the heck it is. Right. 
No noise at all. Nope. Then again, I don't hear them talking anymore either, so. Well, I, I took the sound off. <laughs> oh. So that we could talk. But anyways, yeah, it's four lights, and they're staying pretty much in the same position. Yeah, that's one of those. I'd give anything to be able to know what's behind there in the daytime. Well, you can see the mountain down below. It's darker. There's the actual vehicle. Well, let's go back to the kind of like the beginning of this, you'll see the mountain down below. Okay, let's go down to the beginning of this. Here we go. All right, you see the buildings, see the mountain? Yeah, okay. Yep. It's, a, it's, above, it's above the mountain, so it's not uh, up against it's, the it's mountain. It's airborne. Mm -hmm. Right, it's airborne, yeah, definitely airborne. Okay, we're going to be going into a clip now that is very interesting. I got this from an uh, online collaborator. Uh, he's a homesteader, and he filmed a uh, UFO that's very interesting. And it's near my home state in uh, Montello, Wisconsin. Okay, I'm going to put the sound on in this one. Today's episode of Homestead How. We have a lovely day on our homestead, then a thunderstorm, and later I spot a UFO in the sky. This is not a fake picture of a UFO. I didn't alter it, I didn't Photoshop it. I've got four shots straight up out of my camera. I will swear under oath these are the original shots from my camera, and I don't know what they are. UFOs for sure. Let's take a look. Does that look like an airplane to you? No, no it looks a like a helicopter, light. a drone. It is like a red it's not light my light. drone. Looks like okay, watch. Watch. Here's where it gets scarier. Watch this. Watch. Oh, shoot. Look at the light coming off of it. Emma. Oh, let's just, oh, I showed this to Alyssa. Uh, she's like, oh, you faked it. Like, what, what did I fake? You oh, yeeted it up in the air. What? 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 There's lights coming off of it. There's like a spotlight. It's trying to find me again. Where the government's going to come murder us. That's and, it. If you don't have it, we don't post Look any at, videos. Look at you. You can see the clouds. Okay, so now we're going to zoom into. I showed this to Mom, and she said, <laughs> it's a I showed it to Jen. I showed it to Jen. Wait until she, he zooms in. Judge, they have all this stuff on TV now about how there's unidentified flying objects. And mom's just saying, <laughs> now I catch one on camera, on our property, right overhead. <laughs> She's an alien. Okay, let's crop it. Let's crop in. So this camera is a very nice camera and it's very high resolution. In TV shows, a lot of time you'll see them and they'll say, oh, zoom into the security tape. It's all gray and then it becomes clear. This is actually clear because it's like a 10 million, 20 million megapixel camera or something. So we should be able to zoom in Wait, and get a closer shot. Wait, is it on your nice shot. camera? You could zoom in on your nice camera. It is. It is my nice camera. Yeah. Okay, look, here we're going to edit and then we're going to click crop and we're going to go in closer to see what it looks like closer. So we're going to crop like that. If nothing else, this is a cool shot. You can see the house and the stars. Okay, yeah. crop. What the heck? Oh, oh my like gosh. Called There's little closer. lights. There's little lights. I'll show this on the screen too. Humans Here, I'm gonna take a, I'm gonna take That's a, amazing. Oh my gosh, Mr. Friggin' Moon. Taking a screenshot right now, so I'll show that in the video. And then I'm gonna revert to the original, and I'll show this in the original. I don't need to take a screenshot for it because you can see it. I'll show all of these in the original. <laughs> That's absolutely amazing. That's astonishing. So, here, I'll crop this one too. This is, it's four separate photos. I don't know, you have to go where it looks like there's roller coaster seats. That's the weird heck of a Okay, drone. so this is the thing. I was out there when this came by. Was it fast? I was out there when this came by. I heard something and it sounded just like an engine, like an airplane or something. But then I looked up and I said, what the H double F T M L M O P is that? And then I got those three <laughs> shots. I was on the tripod. I went click, six. click, click. What time was it? And then it flew off that way. And then I tried to get a shot of it going that way, but it was. I was it says on here what time it is. 
Because I went to bed at like 11. So look, there's another one zoomed in. How, is that an airplane? Yeah, what kind of airplane looks just, like that? It doesn't look like a just It kind of looks like a rocket ship. Wait, with like here. an engine. Katie, take this. Oh my gosh, wait. Okay, Draw an illustration so people can see what it is. I'm trying to While see. Katie's doing that. That's the, that was the fourth picture. That wasn't the one I cropped earlier. So now I'm going to revert this one to the original. I'll do the first one. And look, if we go back here, if I click done... Look, it shows, shows the time and everything. June thirteenth. This is a nine. It wasn't even late. It was nine twenty-two p.m. Oh, I it was nine. Nine twenty-two p.m. Well, what the, the time that I didn't look? I up. thought it was later because I almost always I'm out there at like eleven thirty or twelve is when the Milky Way's yeah. out. Katie's um, doing an artist recreation of what this is. If you, if Jen's just like, oh, it's probably a, 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 a plane or a helicopter. She's yeah. She said it's probably a helicopter. She's part of the aliens. What do you think? This looks like a helicopter. In what way is this a helicopter? Because you can even see behind it. How is it a helicopter? Look, it looks like that's the whole bottom's lit up. There's red lights on it. Let's go back to the well, first one. Well, aliens aren't trying to be discreet anymore. They don't care. Mm -hmm. They're just they're searching. The for first that. one I think was the this one has all the red on it. You know, the only thing I'm scared of now because all the stories that I've seen of like aliens coming into people's bed and they can't move, like sleep. That's what? what? I'm terrified. I don't know that. Okay, here we go. We're cropping into the. This is the clearest one. There, that's a helicopter. That's what it was. Is that a helicopter? There's like little Katie, seats. Katie. Look, like, look, you can see stars behind it. If this was a helicopter, wouldn't there be like a thing here and this and then a propeller? And, and then a thing, person? Because this camera you, zooms in far and you can you see, see a window oh, here. Look, like, that looks like a tiny part where the conductor would be or something. What? <laughs> this, <laughs> what are these red things? There's one, two, three, four, five. There's six, eight seven. aliens in it. Then they're all there are eight windows. They're from another, from Mars. Oh my god! They're it tourists. It's probably a window. They're tourists and they're looking out the window and they're like, look at these idiots down here. They think they're <laughs> homesteaders. We should go get mom's reaction. Show this to her. It's a helicopter. We already got a reaction. Just She's leave a scared. comment down below. What is it then? That's absolutely amazing. That's one of the better ones I've seen in a while, actually. Yeah, four shots, and he got it with a really good camera, really clear footage. And if somebody that is a civilian can get that clear footage, why can't the Pentagon release the same thing to us? Absolutely. And, you know, again, it's not like we don't know that they have the 4K video and photos and taken by the pilots with their own cell phone cameras. We know that those photos exist. And that's exactly what we were hoping to see uh, after the release of the report. Sadly, we have not seen anything. And I might also point out that uh, Jeremy Corbell, I haven't seen anything new from him for a while, and he'd been promising that uh, something for quite some time. Right. The last one he put out were the uh, red lights that were over the USS Omaha that were less than awe-inspiring. Um, but, uh, yeah, we're still waiting for some information from uh, – Jeremy Corbell. I'm sure he'll come out with something. Anyways, Tommy, you're muted. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're going to go into our next segment, which is the Bakersfield, California UFO incident. Tommy? Okay, folks. Uh, Bakersfield has always been sort of a hotbed for UFO activity because of its proximity to a very, very sensitive and secretive military bases. Uh, I always found this story to be very interesting because I remember when it happened and this, although it was claimed to be a military aircraft crash, in fact, we'll get into that in just a moment. I thought it was very interesting in the way that it was actually handled by the military because they handled this differently than any other crash I'd ever seen or heard about at the time. This happened. I'm about 15 years old. Let me go ahead and read this to you. Uh, in Bakersfield, California, a mysterious Air Force plane crashed in Sequoia National Forest early Friday, killing the pilot, igniting a 150-acre brush fire, and triggering a cordon of Air Force secrecy. The Air Force refused to say what type of airplane crashed or whether it was an experimental craft from the flight test center at Edwards Air Force Base, about 80 miles so southeast of the crash site. ABC News quoted a Pentagon source as saying that the downed plane was a secret F-19 prototype with stealth technology designed to evade enemy radar. The editor of the Defense Technology magazine said industry and government sources had told him the same thing. Public affairs officials at Edwards, who read brief statements to reporters, confirmed that the crash occurred about 2 a.m. and killed one person. 
the pilot's name was not released. Now, this is where it gets interesting. The whole area had, has been restricted, including the airspace above the crash site. The Kern County Sheriff's Office said, stressing that it was relaying information from the Air Force. There will be military aircraft in the area, and anyone entering the area will be dealt with appropriately by the Air Force, the Sheriff's Office said. General Michael McCraney, head of public affairs for the Air Force, said from the Pentagon that the plane had only one crew member and was definitely not a bomber. No weapons of any kind were on board. Second Lieutenant Eric Schn I don't even know how to pronounce that. Um, Schnabel. Schnabel, okay. Uh, the crash, about 12 miles northeast of Bakersfield, triggered a brush fire that blackened 150 acres of the Sierra Nevada before it was contained at 8 a.m. by Kern County and the U.S. Forest Service firefighters. Kern County Fire Dispatcher John Rus Russo said the crash occurred in the Kern County River Canyon, about 110 miles north of Los Angeles. Well, now, this is one that's always kind of puzzled me because we've actually, this is sort of a tale of two crashes here because there were people, there were this, this thing crashed near a neighborhood. Okay, so there were, there were, well, I won't call it a neighborhood, but let's just say a cluster of houses, a, a, an inhabited area. Okay, now the first thing that the military did, which, well, first of all, it was very interesting because none of the residents of the area heard a loud crash at all. No boom, no sonic boom, like nothing hit the ground. Next thing that they, they know that there's a small fire burning. Military trucks showed up that night and cordoned off the area, but it was weird how they did it because they backed their trucks up with the headlights facing toward the people. In other words, they were trying to blind the people with the line of the headlights from their vehicles while they were dealing with whatever this thing was. Now, it depends on, you know, what you believe. I think there's an argument to be made that this was, in fact, you know, an F-117 that went down. Okay, fine. Maybe that's the case. But again, if that's the case, then why did they treat it differently than they treated every other crash? And, and believe me, every time there's a, there's a, 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 a military jet crash, they treat it with the utmost, um, let's say, well, they, they get right on it. I'll put it that way. Uh, there was one here in Colorado Springs, and it was a Blue Angels, not a Blue Angels, but a, a Thunderbirds jet that crashed landed here recently. And in the broad open daylight and the whole nine yards. And even though that would happen right there, they did not cordon off the area. It's right in the, in the middle of a highway. They didn't do any of that. But for whatever reason, maybe it's because it was stealth. Maybe it's because it was a, an F-117. But they treated this a lot differently, threatening the populace and the whole nine yards. Tim, what are your thoughts on this one? Um, yeah, I think the way they handled it, the one that was closest to the uh, uh, population center, uh, was pretty much indicative of they were trying to hide something. They were yeah. trying to hide something other than a jet. Uh, because mm -hmm. if it was a jet, I think they would have gone in there cleaned it up, cordoned it off, kept people away, but it wouldn't have mattered what the public saw because the technology is so far advanced that common people like us probably wouldn't understand it, although a few of us do have knowledge in that area. It's just it wouldn't be that much of a subject for them to protect. So the way they put their vehicles with their lights facing out, in my opinion, it was probably a UFO uh, crash, and they're using the F-117 crash data as a cover. The neighbor said that there were hundreds of military personnel all over the place within like an instant. It's like they weren't there, then they were there, um, and, which is interesting. You know, if, if you think about it, if it were an F-117, what you've got there is you've got a bunch of pieces, blacked out pieces of a burned up aircraft. They're going to throw them on a flatbed truck and they're going to pull them out of there and they're going to leave. And that's going to be the end of it. Um, I don't believe that even if this was a stealth bomber, I just there weren't enough people there. There wasn't enough uh, of a popular. Uh, let's see. There weren't enough people in that area for this to be that big of a fuss as the military made out of it. Now, again, maybe it was because it was a stealth and maybe that's part of their protocol or whatever. But, you know, they. They sure freaked out about this one, and I, you know, they didn't freak out about the uh, the F-35 that we lost off the coast of San Diego and never, right. never did nope. find it. They didn't freak nope. out like this. It wasn't like no. this. 
Yeah, it was kind of an overreaction no. and overreactions seem to be the case when they're handling something of an un unknown nature. So yes, I agree with Tommy. It, it may have been, may or may not have been a UFO crash. So make up your own mind and uh, read into it. Uh, Bakersfield, California UFO crash is all over Google. So check it out. Most people are saying it's the F-117A that crashed or the F F-19, but there is no definitive proof to state either way. So just have to go on the facts that are presented. Um, our next segment this evening are some encounters. Uh, a couple of them are historic. Uh, one is from a Danish uh, Air Force personnel member. Another one is from um, the Belgian UFO wave that Tommy was referring to a little while ago. And another one is from a gentleman by the name of Omar Lazar, who was a deckhand during the USS Nimitz encounter. So let's go, we'll do that. happened to see flying saucer on several locations on the radar. I even intercepted with four jets in, in 55, and it was clear to me that the saucers we intercepted could hear what I told the pilots, because they reacted on my instructions to the pilots. It was one day when one of my people in the radar called me and said, Major, I was captain at that. Captain, we have uh, something on the screen which passes with a speed of 18,000 kilometers per hour. I went out there, yes, they were passing with 18,000 meters, kilometers per hour. All of a sudden, after some while, they did not pass anymore, they were stationary around the field. And they came and they left without, we could see it. All of a sudden they were there, all of a sudden when the sweep came around, they were gone. I contacted the operations officer and the station commander. They both came out and they wouldn't believe me. I said, give me four aircraft and I'll intercept them. Sometimes there were about 20 objects around the field and sometimes we were down to a, a few. It was fog and therefore a lot of people afterwards said, oh, it was inversion, but it was not. It's proven afterwards it could not be inversion. So at 11 o'clock I had four uh, jets at the runway and at 11 o'clock the fork lifted so we could take off and I ordered the four jets to take off. In that moment there was 12 objects around the field and when I said you are cleared for takeoff to intercept unidentified flying objects, 10 of them went away. Right when the sweep came back there was only two left. One 10 miles north of the field, one 15 miles south of the field. I sent the two aircraft to the north and the two aircraft to the south. Two aircraft to north came first and I said, you, your boogie, which is the object, is 12 o'clock straight ahead. 12 o'clock, distance five miles, altitude unknown. Do we have it inside? Gone. Came the next one. When it came up, I said, your boogie is 12 o'clock, range five miles, altitude unknown. Do we have it inside? Gone. So it was clear they could hear what I said. Perhaps the most convincing evidence for UFOs can be found in Brussels, of all places. For a period of about two years, the whole country was affected by a wave of sightings. They'd been seen by witnesses, the police, and by local radar stations. The Belgian army was forced to take the claim seriously. They allowed their F-16 fighter aircraft to be involved in trying to intercept these UFOs. They had the full backing of the chief of the Belgian air staff, Colonel de Broer. Initially, uh, we thought that some of these observations were caused by uh, atmospheric interference, uh, such as weather conditions or uh, electromagnetic interference. 
but later on, we found out that at uh, certain moments, indeed, we could uh, relate one uh, visual observation with one observation on the radar. And of course, then we said, uh, well, to have a confirmation, it uh, may be very useful to have an additional observation from an aircraft. The aircraft were deployed as part of a routine training program. Most times nothing was seen, except on one particular night. The night of 30 and 34 uh, March, um, we had an observation on the uh, radar and in addition, a visual observation on the ground confirmed by the police. We decided to send two airplanes in the air uh, around midnight. This video of the F-16's radar track of the object showed the performance of a vehicle of a totally unknown origin. The Air Force were at a complete loss to explain their findings. A press conference was called. What these pilots um, uh, detected was well outside the normal flying envelope of an airplane. Sometimes they had what we call lock-ons, which gave a parameters varying from speeds between 150 knots till uh, 990 knots, uh, an acceleration which occurred in a few seconds. The Americans denied it was a secret spy plane, so could it have been the first official contact with an alien craft? The speeds would be impossible to, to tolerate uh, for a human being. Uh, that's a, a first point. A second point is uh, the visual observations always describe a, a system, a machine, which hangs and hovers above the surface at quite a low altitude without making any noise. Now, uh, with the uh, current technology, that would be impossible. So far, the Belgian authorities have refused to announce any official conclusion to subsequent investigations. Omar Lara was an enlisted sailor who worked on the Nimitz's aviation fuel systems. Jets would come in, park, we'd fuel them up, they'll disembark. In November 2004, the Nimitz led a carrier strike group on a training exercise off the Southern California coast that included an attack submarine and the advanced radar-equipped USS Princeton. Several days after the infamous Tic Tac video was taken, Laura says he was on the Nimitz deck responding to what turned out to be a false alarm of a man overboard. All the jets had left, except for the personnel who take care of maintenance and the work centers on board the aircraft carrier. And a sailor had fallen overboard. And at that time, a man overboard was called. And everyone needs to report in person. So we uh, ended up on the fantail, starboard side, looking towards out to the vast oceans, a beautiful panoramic view. And out of nowhere, this object drops out from the sky at incredible speed just plants itself right above the ocean. The object itself was this white, luminescent object. This thing did not stop or slow down up until maybe 100 feet above the waterline, and it stopped on a dime. Then it zipped off to our right at incredible speed with no sonic boom. You had to literally move your, your torso, a slight turn to your right to follow it. The speed and the maneuverability of this object is nothing I've ever seen in my 10 years in the United States Navy. I do not believe that what I saw was made on this planet. If it wasn't made by us, then you can count us off as the number one superpower. This thing just basically made you feel smaller. It's a paradigm changer. It really does. I mean, you just when you see it, when you see it live, when you see it in person, 
when it's right in front of you, when it's happening right there and then, and you go through all of the um, the normal things through your mind. Is it a balloon? Is it a helicopter? Is it a this? Is it the second coming of Jesus? All those things are exhausted, okay? Um, it really is a paradigm changer. Tim, you're... Yeah, it's definitely a paradigm changer. It changed my mm -hmm. worldview. And I used to think, uh, you know, UFOs were just lights distantly in the sky until I saw something up close and then uh, changed my worldview. I'm telling you, you, you start wrapping your head around different ideas that you never thought possible before. You know, things that your mom and dad told you that didn't exist perhaps do. So it's amazing what's out there that we have yet to discover. And if you need to dig deeper into the journey, come over to UFO Man and check out our content. Tommy? Well, I mean, I, I absolutely. Um, folks, you know, to go back into um, some of the things that we've talked about, about this evening, especially, you know, and I, keep, I hate to keep throwing this up, but I mean, I, if we don't keep driving the point home, if we don't write letters, if we don't make our voices heard out there to the people that are in the government, we're never going to get any more of that report than we ever got. OK, that's what it's going to take. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to probably tomorrow I'll go ahead and get some kind of a form or something where you can actually go to our website, get your information, get the information about who to kick an email to. Well, I'll even put out a form that you can just go ahead and copy and paste it, um, but demand more information because this is crap. We all know it's crap. Um, it just seems to be, I mean, the, the longer we get, the, the further we get away from the drop of that report, somehow the matter I'm getting and the more upset I'm getting, let's say, and, and you know, I'm not the only person that feels that way. Um, you know, we know that those photos exist. Show us these photos that you said were science fiction movie like. I want to see those. And I know that you folks do too. I think maybe what we ought to do, Tommy, is put a petition on our uh, website and then people can come sign the petition and then we'll submit it uh, when we reach so many signatures we'll submit it to uh, our local legislation legislators and perhaps even the federal government to try and show that there is a grassroots movement out there that really needs uh, some explanation of what's going on I mean come on yeah. You've been messing with us for over 74 years. It's time to buck up and tell us what's going on. I mean, I think we're grown up enough to be able to handle the issue and, for, and for, if, for the most part. If, and if some of us aren't, then some of us aren't. And that's just the way it goes. But then again, there are some people that you can just absolutely panic with anything. I mean, how many people have we seen lately that, that are almost like an ape in a cage and somebody's just holding a snake up in the, and scaring them with it? I mean, they're really easy to do that with. You're going to get that. But at the end of the day, I mean, most people are logical, intelligent human beings. We've already kind of figured out the fact that, yeah, we're not alone in the universe. That's pretty much mathematically impossible. All right. So cut the crap and give us something tangible. Give us something that we already know exists. Why don't, you know, if they did that, they might even restore a teeny tiny, teeny, teeny tiny, it's a little bit of faith in the government of the United States. I mean, that'd be a great gesture anyway. We're getting really good responses from the chat room in regards to the petition. Corey Wager mm -hmm. said he'll fill out a form. Uh, Tracy Kane said it was a great idea. So I think we should follow up on that, Tommy. You will. Uh, we'll follow up on that and we'll uh, come out on the next live stream or a couple live streams from now and let you know about the petition and where to go and where to sign it and what information to put on it. But we'll also keep you uh, all your personal information anonymous, uh, other than the fact that we need your name. Um, all right. The next thing that I want to talk about is something that Tommy referred to a couple weeks ago in another live stream. Uh, we were talking about the Mount Goro, G-A-U-R-O, Naples, Italy, uh, UFO or disc that was found in a lava tube inside a cave with the mountain growing around it. Now, I actually found some actual pictures of that. Here's one of them. Okay, these are cave explorers that came across the disc in a lava tube. You can see it sitting there on the shelf like it's stuck and some of the mountain is growing around it. 
Now, a little closer image. Um, you can actually see uh, like a metallic rim around the edge. It is curved. And up near the top in the center is an opening. And allegedly, uh, they were able to access the insides of this craft and see some things. Right, Tommy? Yes, absolutely. Um, in fact, one of the... Uh... It's rumored, again, who knows if this is true or not, but they found small cages inside of there with baby dinosaur bones in them, like they were taking specimens back to wherever they're from or whatever. Um, can you imagine if, if that DNA still existed, if, if all the creatures that still lived on Earth existed in some alien database somewhere? Wouldn't that be wild? Yeah, it's really hard, though, to get uh, DNA from bone unless there's marrow still in the bone. No, I'm talking about because they can't, they were here 65 million years ago, and they were when that thing got stuck, they those little creatures were alive. They were taking living specimens back, and right. then all of a sudden, um, you know, it, whatever this event was that actually entombed this thing in the mountain, um, you know, they couldn't get out, and they left those those creatures in them, and the bones are, are there. They found those. That's just so interesting. Well, the the mountain itself is actually made out of lava rock and lava tubes, so it may be that the ground shifted and formed that mountain around that craft at one time. And what we were talking about before the live stream was, is this kind of correlates with the idea that UFOs travel in and out of volcanoes and that they travel through lava tubes. And maybe this one just got stuck or crashed or had some type of difficulty. So that does show proof that there's something going on with lava tubes and UFOs. Now, Another thing is, is that uh, with them taking specimens, it shows that they were taking DNA and specimens way before human population grew into Homo erectus. Yeah, we weren't here yet, not, not by a long shot. And that, no. that's what's so amazing about this. Um, and, and as we've said before on the channel, and we've, we've shown, you know, photo and video after video and of all that of... Uh, ancient carvings and cave paintings where there's things that are, you know, hey, that's a UFO sitting there. You know what I mean? It can't really be anything else. We've talked about those. Um, this is another example of that. But th but this, um, it's just so interesting that it looks like they were trying to take back samples. They were trying to take back specimens. And if you think about it, if you have a craft that can go from, well, outer space, drop through the atmosphere and into the sea in a matter of a couple of seconds and still be intact, then you probably don't have a problem with going through lava tubes or, you know, the lava is probably just another medium. It, it probably doesn't matter what the medium is. You know what I mean? It's got some sort of a bubble around the craft or whatever. Um, but yeah, I mean, this, this, by, by all um, evidence that we can come up with and everybody that we've read about on this issue right here, that is authentic. What you're seeing right there, folks. Right. And world leaders were said to have wanted to come to the site, but the problem was is that the lava tube cave where this was located was through minimal fractures in the ground. I mean, you had to be really thin and a really good cave spelunker or a cave explorer to get down there. You had to be experienced. They could not get, people in there. If you look at the picture, there is an oxygen tank on the ground, which means that they were going through tight areas. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, this was Italy, Tim? Yes. Naples, Italy. It's right near Naples, Italy. Yep. And it's actually near a U.S. Army uh, base of some sort, actually. So, um, a base was made at the foot of uh, Mount Goro. So maybe that's why. Who knows? Um, it's just interesting that this picture here, being the clearest that I could find, uh, exists today as actual evidence of some type of vehicle trapped in a lava tube inside a mountain. And it's very interesting. And Tommy brought it up two weeks, so I two weeks ago, so I thought I'd bring it out today. So here you go. Okay. Told, told you. <laughs> yep. He told he told me. Yep. <laughs> and I found it. So there we go. All right. One thing we want to show you tonight is hold on a second here. 
Okay, one thing we want to show you tonight is we want to show you some of our merchandise because we've never done that before. And here we go. Here's some of our new merchandise. All right, we got hoodies, shirts, glasses, cups, tumblers, you name it. UFO Man Channel's got it. We just want you to know about it just in case you are you get interested in wanting to show your loyalty to the UFO channel and show your colors. And these are our original shirts that Tommy wears. Tommy wears one of them. He wears the UFO Man Nation shirt, which is the one on the left. This is the original logo of the channel. I still keep it, so if you're interested, the links will be under the live stream after the stream is over. <clears throat> okay uh tommy any last words well actually um you know folks this might be a little bit of a shorter show this evening because we did one last night uh used you know it's kind of hard for us to do too because we we really want to give the best material we can things of that nature uh so we might be a little bit light tonight plus we're kind of tired to be honest um you know that being said uh you know we're going to keep at this folks again we're going to go ahead and put out uh, uh, I'll keep looking at our website, um, let's say tomorrow, probably tomorrow evening, and I'm going to go ahead and get that petition up out there. So let's go ahead and get this thing filled out. And, you know, we, we all we want the answers that we're entitled to. And that's all we're asking for. You know, we're not asking for the government to come out and say, oh, well, we pick this up on a microwave sensor or a laser sensor or whatever kind of super secret technology that they have. We're not asking for that. We don't want to see that. OK, uh, radar tracks from common radar would be nice, but OK, fine. But if, uh, well, if everything rings true, and, and I believe that this is true, they have very clear photos taken by pilots with cell phone cameras of vehicles that are actually almost flying in formation with them. I mean, they're like right there. And as we've discussed in, in a prior show, um, you know, cell phone photograph technology is not classified. Okay. They're just trying to keep it from the public. We know of a senator that came out uh, under his breath and said that, he was one of the people that actually saw the unclassified version of the report and he compared it to a science fiction movie. Okay. Oh, the, cl the classified version. Right. The, yeah. The classified version. Correct. And you know, he was disturbed by it. Um, so, you know, th those are the kinds of things that I think that we're entitled to see. I think that we're ready for it. And um, you know, the only way that the only way we're going to get that stuff is that we keep screaming we just keep bugging the heck out of them. And then maybe we'll get something out of them. But we're going to go ahead and give that a shot, folks. Right. And the thing is that that classified version had 14, count them, 14 high-definition, high-quality videos from 4K cameras, mm -hmm. all right, released to Congress and the intelligence community. Did we, the public, get any of that? Oh, of course not. We were only allowed to see the blurry FLIR footage or the distant footage that Jeremy Corpel put out recently, which I do appreciate that he put it out, but the fact is it wasn't definitive because we couldn't really tell what it was. Yeah, we can't, so, we can't really use it. Right, so I would like confirmation. I already know that UFOs exist. Yeah. Tommy knows that UFOs exist, and a lot of you out there know as well. But the thing is, it would be nice to get uh, confirmation from the U.S. government saying, hey, you're not a bunch of crackpots. You're not a bunch of hacks. We've been treating you wrong for 74 years. We've been lying to you all this time. And yes, they exist, and we're working on them. It's like I always say. You don't have to convince me. I'm already convinced. What I would like is for you to convince my neighbor, my friend, my coworker, my parents, whoever, okay? That's who you need to convince. You, I've, I've, I've been there, done that. I've seen it. And that's what I, I, you know, I think that if we could get more information out there to the people that are absolute deniers, maybe it will wake some of them up. Maybe that's, you know, it's going to take that, but, but it's going to take that photo of that UFO sitting next to the F-18 with the alien, you know, throwing up the cowabunga, whatever. It's going to take that in order for some people to actually understand and accept it. And even then, you're going to get people to say, oh, that's just Photoshop. So, but let's I, we gotta get on the path. We get, you can't get anywhere until you take the first step. Right. And I got to say this. Amanda B. said life has gotten more exciting. Thank God. Yes, it has. And that's why we all need to pursue this to the very end, I think. Um, if, we, if you want answers, you got to dig. 
if you don't dig, we can't find any information. And that's how we found out about the crater report and how how nobody's talking about it. I mean, the media is not even coming out and saying, hey, there might be a report in September. Keep your ear to the ground. Listen. Well, I'm I'm letting you know you need to listen and and read up on the crater report and check to see if it's going to come out. Because if it does and it verifies that these materials are made off world and not uh, not on the space center on the International Space Station, now I'm talking off planet. If that's the case, then that's definitive proof, and that might be one of the steps toward full transparency and disclosure. Mm-hmm. So, Tommy, any last words? That's all we've got. That's all we've got. All, all we have, <laughs> all we have left is a voice, folks. I mean, they they've they've taken our dignity away from us for years. They've scared us into into silence over the subject. Believe me, I've been a part of that, and I, well, I've been subjected to it. How about that? Um, you know, and and now that we're finally on the cusp of a, probably a new level of understanding of humanity, and you know, instead of giving us again just a taste of of what's going on, they're saying, "Well, we're still looking into it." Well, I'm sorry, kids, boys, and girls, that is not good enough. Not good enough for me. They've had decades to study this, and if they've got, I mean, just in a in a 15 year span, they have, you know, that many great videos and photos of, of what they're seeing out there. Imagine, you know, what what's bef- Prior to that, imagine what they saw in the 90s um, or the 80s or the 70s, you know. And again, right. it's like we always say, the, the tragedy of the whole thing, of the whole UFO conspiracy thing, the whole, uh, the, the whole U, uh, governmental uh, misinformation um, program, basically, is that there's so many great stories out there and probably one fantastic evidence, actually, that we'll never see because the people who were in possession of it never released it for fear of retribution, for fear, for fear of losing their jobs, their lives, uh, becoming pariah essentially, okay? And we'll never know because they died without telling us because of the suppression of this, and it's sad. Right. Um, we're gonna pursue the issue and we're gonna carry the torch from the people before us so that we can dig deeper into the subject and bring you the truth as far as we can find it. Yeah. So we hope you can join us next week for our journey into the truth. Uh, we have a guest next week. Her name is Barbara Jean Lindsay. She is someone that we met in contact in the desert uh, UFO conference. She was a uh, coordinator and participant in the Cosmic Cafe segment of Contact in the Desert, where Tommy and I participated, and we are again going to participate soon they're going to do one more cosmic cafe for the contact in the desert and we are being featured so if you're on there check us out um i want to say thank you to everybody in the uh chat room for coming this evening and i want to thank everybody who participated online and as always from tommy and myself 